Angela and I'd particularly like to thank um, John Furlong and Mark Isherwood and Rachel Price for making it possible for me to be here, encouraging me to do this in the first place, um, briefing me very well and doing all of the logistics. So thank you. Um, it's lovely to be here with you. So I began life as a student of history and it seems the older I get, the more my historian's training frames the way I talk and think about education. As many of you would know, the UK has a very old and proud tradition of teacher as researcher. And rather than try to reinvent the wheel, I'm going to delve a little into this history today, if for no other reason than to remind us that many of the ideas that proliferate in contemporary education policy and practice have long and distinguished roots. Roots that sometimes get forgotten or conveniently left aside when ideas are put to more performative ends. So, to Lawrence Stenhouse, arguably the father of this rich tradition of teacher research in the UK. Eminent Professor of Education at the University of East Anglia, founder of CARE, the Centre for Applied Research in Education in the early 1970s, director of the Humanities Curriculum Project, passionate advocate for teachers as agents and architects of their own practice, and for students as the consequential stakeholders in schooling. As an aside, if you're not familiar with Stenhouse's work and would like to find out more, the CARE website hosts a fabulous archive of his writings that have all been digitised and are publicly available. So I can't make up my mind as to whether Stenhouse would be delighted or appalled by the current turn toward teachers and research internationally. He was most staunch advocate for the engagement of teachers in and with research. And also of a particular vision of teacher professionalism that saw teachers as knowledge workers, intellectual workers, curriculum workers, and as an embedded part of this, as applied researchers. I see some strong parallels between Stenhouse's position on teachers and what we might now think of as teacher professionalism, although that discourse was a bit different in his time. And what our John Furlong has recently referred to as Graham Donaldson's new view of teacher professionalism here in Wales. In his work on teachers and research, Stenhouse repeatedly came back to the idea of judgment. Teacher professional judgment was for him absolutely critical to both practice generally and research informed practice particularly. For example, consider this quotation, which for the sake of emphasis, I'll read to you in English. Please forgive me for the fact that my Welsh is not very good. <laughs> Language education in Australia is notoriously bad. In providing advice to teachers in, on how to engage with research, Stenhouse had the following to say. I'd like you to assume the position that any results I present to you are less reliable than your own experience properly examined. Properly examined. That because those results are in terms of general trends and possibilities, they are not reliable for your own experience, so they have to be tested by your judgment. I think measurement should be subordinate to judgment. If after comparing the measurement results with your own experience, you find yourself uncertain of judgment, then basically, there's no alternative to doing research in your own classroom. Secondly, results are intended to contribute to your perception of the situation. They are not intended to discriminate one course of action which would be better for you than another. Elsewhere in discussing teacher professional judgment, he wrote the essence of emancipation as I conceive it is the intellectual, moral and spiritual autonomy which we recognise when we eschew paternalism and the rule of authority and hold ourselves obliged to appeal to judgment. For Stenhouse, professional judgment was a critical resource for teachers, both in engaging in and with research and engaging in all other aspects of practice. Furthermore, he saw teachers' capacity to develop and exercise their professional judgment to be a critical marker of teacher professionalism. Furthermore, we see in this quotation the suggestion that in engaging with research, teachers should take what Susan Groundwater Smith and I have named as a forensic approach to evidence, rather than an adversarial one. The very idea here is that it's all about understanding what's going on, as Stenhouse puts it, contributing to your perception of the situation, rather than obtaining incontrovertible proof that course of action A is better than course of action B. But more on Stenhouse and evidence later. So returning to the question of whether he might be delighted or appalled by where we are right now in most of the Western world around the question of teachers engaging with research, I suspect he would think it was something of both the best and the worst of times. The 
the best of times because a good 40 years since some of his most influential and, and important writing about the relationship between teachers and research. The concept of teachers' engagement with research has finally gone mainstream. Ideas about the importance of teachers' engagement with and in research are increasingly being embedded in government policy, discussed in relation to initial teacher education and ongoing professional development by professional associations, research associations and higher education institutions. The worst of times because the conceptualisation of research and evidence that has come to dominate these discussions, which far from Stenhouse's original vision, tends to be very narrow and view teacher professional judgment as a source of suspicious subjectivity that should be sidelined in the research enterprise rather than the critical resource Stenhouse saw it as. And really this makes all the difference to what it is we're trying to achieve through teachers' engagement in and with research. And it has important resonances for how we go about it. So that was a very long-winded introduction to the argument that I'd like to make this afternoon. I want to suggest that teachers' engagement in and with research can indeed be an important part of striving toward a new view of teacher professionalism, but only if it happens against the grain. In this, I give a hat tip to Marilyn Cochran Smith's influential essay published in 1991 called Learning to Teach Against the Grain, in which she argued for the critical need for us to learn to teach in such a way that we collectively act upon our responsibility to reform, not just replicate standard school practices. In other words, engage a kind of teaching practice that is both transformed and transformative. She observed that the educational orthodoxies of the day put the transformative agenda for education at risk, and thus that teaching with the grain was likely to undermine rather than contribute to this agenda. So I want to suggest in this talk that there are three things that we might think of as aims for teachers' engagement in and with research in the contemporary age. That is, three things that engaging in and with research can do for the teaching profession. And I'm going to talk briefly about these. I'm going to devote most of the talk, however, to the how rather than the what, in the form of three essential and ongoing tasks that I think might get us there. Then, if I may be so bold, by way of pointing to some structures that might sustain teachers' engagement with research, I'm going to draw on two examples from the other side of the world. Not because I want to suggest that all things education hum along happily and smoothly in Australia. Even all the way down there, we are largely at the mercy of the global education reform movement. And from my slightly obsessive reading over the past few months about what's happening in Wales, I'm pretty sure that we're far less courageous than you about what to do about it. But rather because I think that these are two quite distinct examples of where we did manage to get it right, albeit for a time. So, <clears throat> to three key aims for teachers' engagement with research. I'm going to talk briefly about each of these. They're the building of teachers' research literacy, the privilege of teacher knowledge, and the opening up of communicative space. For each of them, I'm going to draw on one important piece of literature that I'd suggest might provide a good way in should you want to read more about this. Um, and certainly, I think Angela said earlier that, that she's hoping that the slides will be available. I'm very happy for you to have my slides, and there's a reference list at the end that might provide a starting point. So I'm going to start with research literacy. This beautiful diagram, I'm a sucker for a good diagram, always have been, is from the British Educational Research Association Royal Society for the Encouragement of the Arts, Manufacturing and Commerce report entitled Research in the Teaching Profession, Building the Capacity for a Self-Improving Education System. It was authored by Furlong, Mentor, Munn, Witte, Halgarten and Johnson in 2014. In this diagram, and in the report more broadly, they mount an argument for positioning research literacy as a key component of teacher professional identity. One of three dimensions, along with subject and pedagogical knowledge and practical experience of teacher effectiveness and professional identity. Furthermore, research literacy in this context is said to rely on research-based knowledge, theory and scholarship, along with research-related skills and inquiry. They define research literacy in the report as the extent to which teachers and school and college leaders are familiar with a range of research methods, with the latest research findings and with the implications of this research for their day-to-day -day practice, and for education policy and practice more broadly. To be research literate, this is the bit I really love, is to get research, to understand why it is important and what might be learned from it, to maintain a sense of critical appreciation and healthy scepticism throughout. This 
is a kind of research literacy that is very much about researching practice. It goes well beyond the level of research literacy required for initial teacher education students to complete written assignments while at university, and it reaches into the realm of career-long professional learning, raising questions about how well-equipped teachers are to use educational research as an ongoing source of professional knowledge, both reading it and thinking about it and engaging in it themselves. This kind of research literacy is only built through teachers' critical engagement with research as part of practice. Its construction certainly can and should be begun as part of ITE, but it's very much a career-long proposition. And too often in the past, we've seen research literacy as a means to an end related to academic study, rather than a practical tool with ongoing utility for teachers over the course of a career. So the second day, the privileging of teacher knowledge. Marilyn Cochran Smith and Susan Lytle, who wrote very powerfully together about teachers and research in the 1990s and 2000s, talked about the relationship between teacher knowledge and inquiry in this way. Essentially, teachers and students negotiate what counts as knowledge in the classroom, who can have knowledge, and how knowledge can be generated, challenged and evaluated. Through inquiry, teachers come to understand how this happens in their own classrooms, and how their interpretation of classroom events are shaped. Teacher inquiry is a way for teachers to know their own knowledge. That is, engaging in inquiry, teachers seize the capacity to have their own knowledge of and about education and practice privileged within the community of their schools and their school systems. This has a number of effects, including greater confidence in their knowledge, an opening up of knowledge to discussion and critique that goes hand in hand with the inquiry process itself, and over time the adoption of what they later termed inquiry as stance. The idea that the frame of research and inquiry becomes a way of being and thinking for teachers about professional practice. And finally, to the opening of communicative space, a concept that comes from the work of philosopher and sociologist Jürgen Habermas, who developed what he termed a theory of communicative action. So Stephen Kennis, another Australian, and one who worked at the University of East Anglia in Stenhouse's time, coincidentally, probably not that coincidentally, actually, now I think about it, um, has long worked with Habermas's notion of communicative space in relation to teachers and research. On this, he and Wolf Carr have written much, including this. In short, action research is a form of research that seeks to create the kind of communicative <coughs> space within which practitioners can participate in making decisions, taking actions and collaboratively inquiring into their own practices, their understandings of these practices and the conditions under which they practice. Those of you who heard my colleague and friend Jenny Gore speak in Cardiff last year will have heard of the success of quality teaching rounds, which itself is a form of teachers engaging in and with research, in opening up communicative spaces for teachers in which they can have those kinds of conversations about their practice that leads to development and pedagogical risk-taking. So this then is the third aim, the creation of such spaces through engagement with research. So given these three important aims, how do we get there? I want to talk about three ongoing tasks that I see as critical to helping us along. First, reclaiming the notion of evidence-based practice from narrow conceptualisations of evidence and claims of what works that have infected it over the past decade. Second, embracing complexity and uncertainty, recognising and owning and in fact celebrating that education is a messy and human business, that it's not a simple case of inputs and outputs and that using these not only as a mode of being but a catalyst for collaboration and learning. And third, repossessing professional judgement from ideas that say it is subjective and untrustworthy and to be treated with something of suspicion putting it to work in the name not only of teacher professionalism, but also of teacher and pupil learning. So first of all, reclaiming evidence-based practice from narrow conceptualisations of evidence. I want to suggest to you that there's absolutely nothing wrong with the idea of evidence-based practice. Teachers have a wealth of evidence to hand as a consequence of their work. From student work generated in the course of teaching and learning, to assessment tasks, to systematic reflections on their practice, to externally generated test scores and so on. The idea that teachers might base the 1,500 or so decisions they make each day on this evidence is not contentious. 
Indeed, that's the way that good teachers have always functioned. In recent years, however, in the UK and elsewhere, the evidence said to count in evidence-based practice has become narrower and narrower. And evidence-based practice has become a proxy for the idea that teachers should somehow cede their professional knowledge about practice over to a higher power. Ben Goldacre, whom I'm sure many of you know of, a medical doctor and author of Bad Science, was commissioned by Michael Gove in 2013, for example, to author a report called Building Evidence into Education, in which he encouraged teachers to conduct randomised control trials in their classrooms, arguing that randomised trials are the best way to find out how well a new intervention works. They ensure that the pupils and schools getting a new intervention are the same as the pupils and schools still getting an old one because they're all randomly selected from the same pool. So Goldacre effectively equates the evidence in evidence-based practice with evidence obtained via randomised controlled trials, an approach to research where the researcher divides a group randomly, applies an intervention to one group, withholds it from the other and looks at the difference in outcomes. Now, while I'll happily concede that this is one form of evidence, and it can, it can be a very powerful one, there's no denying that, when used appropriately, the idea that it constitutes the best form of evidence for teachers to use in making decisions about their practice is quite simply incorrect and dangerous, and predicated upon an assumption that results or outcomes of research generated in one place can be successfully and simply applied everywhere else. It's the opposite of Stenhouse's warning in the opening quotation that results are intended to contribute to your perception of the situation. They are not intended to discriminate one course of action which would be better for you than another. Unless this be construed as a criticism that only researchers with a qualitative as opposed to quantitative bent might mount, I'd also like to note that Lee Cronbach, 20th century statistician extraordinaire, so much so that his name is, system, is synonymous with the statistical measure of reliability, wrote that when we give proper weight to local conditions, any generalisation, such as one generated by a randomised control trial, that were, they were my words in the middle there, is a working hypothesis, not a conclusion. So it seems that even Cronbach would perhaps question what Goldacre has to say to teachers. These ideas are hardly confined to the UK, however. Here's a diagram generated in my own context of the state of New South Wales. Incidentally, last year I went to what um, to actual South Wales, what I like to think of as old South Wales, <laughs> and I do definitely see the family resemblance. This diagram was generated by the New South Wales Department of Education Centre for Educational Statistics and Evaluation and appears in a number of places, including an evidence guide for teachers. You can see here that evidence has been hand organised handily into gold, silver and other. There isn't even a bronze medal here, just other. And that by way of categorising it, the only kind of evidence that gets a look in is that which is either generated by experiments involving randomisation, experiments that don't involve randomisation, and pre and post comparisons of things like student test scores. At the very bottom of the hierarchy is everything else bundled into what they call expert opinion. So that would be the opinions of teachers, the opinions of educational researchers. Of course, the irony is that you're engaged in listening to alleged expert opinion right now, so take this as a warning. This kind of narrow rendering of evidence is problematic on a number of levels, and I could probably talk for hours about the ins and outs of those problems, but don't worry, I'm not going to do that. The major one is that at its heart, there's a deep misconception of what education and the role of the teacher actually is. One that guides a lot of contemporary education policy making in parts of the world other than Wales. And one in which some of those parts of the world were in danger of the teaching profession buying into and being redefined by. Back to Stenhouse. Here he's talking about this narrow rendering of evidence does us no favours and is in fact not our friend. He says, personally I am satisfied at the application of this so-called psychostatistical paradigm in education research provides no reliable guide to action, although it may contribute a little to theory. It has to assume, as agriculturalists assume in treating across the field, consistency of treatment throughout the treatment group, but it is the teacher's job to work like a gardener rather than a farmer differentiating the treatment of each subject and each learner, as the gardener does each flower bed and each plant. That when we think about the role of the teacher, the important thing is the differentiation. We're not trying to apply the same treatment to everybody. That's not how it works. So here's the crux of it. So much of the work of teachers is about differentiated practice, 
then bending over backwards to generate so-called evidence of what works is deeply counterproductive. For as Dylan William has been known to say, everything works somewhere and nothing works everywhere. Another reason why it's deeply problematic is because the opportunity cost is so great. Some recent research that I've done with my colleague, Dr. Megan Stacey from the University of New South Wales on teachers' conceptions of good evidence and their engagement with research has itself provided good evidence. See what I just did there? <laughs> that teachers well understand the multifarious sources of evidence at their fingertips, but feel constrained by what is seen to count. As Anne, that's a pseudonym chosen by him, a deputy principal in a New South Wales public secondary school told us in an interview, good sources of evidence of my practice are all going to be different. They're all going to be ephemeral. They're all going to be very individual in that fleeting, ethereal, flash in the pan and gone stuff. You can count that, but you can't data it. You can't pin it to a wall and go, look, I can't put that on a spreadsheet and go, you know, I don't know how you data that. So in summary, Reclaiming evidence-based practice involves moving from these narrow conceptualisations of evidence about what works to valuing rich, contextualised understandings of evidence, recognising that different evidence comes from different sources and matching the purpose of the research, the questions that we ask, to the evidence. It might also help if we could shift from a focus on evidence for performative accountability, that is the requirement to be constantly demonstrating effectiveness, to one on evidence for what Onora O'Neill has termed intelligent accountability, the kind of accountability that sees us as a profession authentically accountable to our communities, including our students and our colleagues. And finally, and related to both of these, a shift from a desire to use evidence to prove the rectitude of one approach over another in an adversarial way, to a more forensic approach that seeks to foster a deep understanding of practice in context. The second task is about embracing uncertainty and complexity. Sociologists have long recognised the drive for certainty as part of the human condition in our troubled times. <clears throat> part of the lure of the narrow conceptions of evidence I've just been talking about is the certainty they offer. The international push for standardisation of all kinds in education, of curriculum, assessment, pedagogy, teachers' work and so on, is part of a desire to shore up certainty in a world that is in its very essence an uncertain place. So often we seek to strip the human dimension away, to teacher-proof the curriculum and the classroom, to guarantee consistency in teaching and learning as if there was consistency in students. And as my friend and long-term partner in crime, Susan Groundwater-Smith and I have written, and I quote this not because I'm so arrogant to think I have the last word on it, but rather to acknowledge that a lot of the thinking that I've done about this over the years has been done in concert with her. In relation to the uncertainty of our times, eliminating the human dimension of education is not the answer. A more generative response would be to recognise that within this complexity, a teaching profession that understands what constitutes good but varied evidence of learning and how to engage in true evidence-informed practice, bringing, building complex pictures of student learning to inform their judgement and decision-making is in fact critical. So rather than seek to eliminate the human dimension of education, I want to suggest we might aspire to what the physicist James Clerk Maxwell, whom I reliably told is the greatest physicist between Newton and Einstein. Sounds like he just got picked by Einstein. It's a <laughs> thing, but anyway. Um, what he called thoroughly conscious ignorance, and which he argued was an essential condition for breaking new ground in any endeavour. This is the state where we move from not knowing what we don't know to being conscious of what we don't know and claiming it. Thoroughly conscious ignorance is deeply unpopular in these times of preferred certainty and performativity. Admitting what we don't know can make us vulnerable, can open us up to accusations that we're part of the problem of teacher quality or lack thereof, can make us feel or fear that we're not on our game. Part of the key to becoming comfortable with thoroughly conscious ignorance lies in recognising the importance of the kind of collaboration that values different expertise as different but equal. In relation to initial and ongoing teacher education, I'm talking here about school-based and university-based teacher educators inhabiting each other's castles, and I know you do a lot of that um, here in Wales, to use the metaphor coined by Bridget Somick in a 1990s paper on the power of partnership in action research, something that I'll return to a little in a moment. 
Seeking to develop authentic communities of practice within and across schools could also be a useful strategy here. And again, I know that we're engaged in some of this here in Wales. While it's fashionable these days to call any group of two or more teachers working together in any capacity a community of practice, or it certainly is where I come from, <laughs> Levin Wenger's model of communities of practice sets out joint enterprise toward a substantial goal, mutual and substantive engagement in the practices that characterise the community, and a strong sense of shared repertoires of practice as the key tenets. These are robust and demanding commitments, and they don't come about by happenstance. They take time and determination to develop. Done well, however, they're the kinds of things that are easy to say, but really, really hard to do. Done well, however, they maximise the potential of the communicative space, which I earlier suggested might be an aim of teachers' engagement in and with research. And then finally, repossessing teacher professional judgement from arguments that it is subjective and thus unreliable and untrustworthy. And I use the word repossessing advisedly here. It's more than reclaiming. Professional judgment is, as I argued with Stenhouse earlier, a critical resource. Furthermore, it belongs to the teaching profession and we need to get it back. In his seminal article entitled The Teacher's Soul and the Terrors of Performativity, a cracking read, if not an entirely uplifting one, Stephen Ball talked about a value schizophrenia that had come to plague the teaching profession. He said a kind of value schizophrenia is experienced by individual teachers where commitment, judgment and authenticity within practice are sacrificed for impression and performance. Here there is a potential splitting between the teacher's own judgments about good practice and students' needs and the rigours of performance. This was something that Megan and I found quite consistently in our recent research too. <coughs> it's there in Print Deputy Principal Anne's observation that you saw earlier that you can't data what he felt really mattered about his work. And manifestations of it were scattered amongst the 21 interviews we conducted and the 400 plus surveys that were completed as part of that project. For example, here it is from Dorothy, who prior to this in her interview had railed at some length about standardised testing results and the impoverished version of evidence of anything they constituted in her practice, but nevertheless the evils to which they had been put in her school and cluster of schools. When asked what she thought constituted good evidence of practice, she took a deep breath and said, well, you have to look at the numbers. You have to have that evidence because in the end you're going to have your PMD. That's a performance and development review that all Australian teachers, most Australian teachers have once a year. And they're like, well, why are you doing that? You have to show something. You can't just go, well, I think this, because sadly it's not good enough to say I think this. You've got to have the numbers. You've got to have the proof. It's like with everything. In Dorothy's words here, we see the splitting between teachers' own judgments about good practice and students' needs and the rigours of performance that Ball wrote of in action. The thing that strikes me here is that for Dorothy, there's nothing between the numbers contributed by external measures and Phil Pinion. It's either the numbers or I think this. And she was by no means alone amongst the teachers we spoke to. My suspicion is that many teachers have been conned by endless moves towards standardisation into feeling that there can be nothing rigorous or systematic about their judgment, that in order for evidence to be valid and reliable, it needs to be generated elsewhere in numeric form. But at the end of the day, we need to remember that no matter how sophisticated a tool can be developed for measuring educational outcomes, there is always judgment involved. To put it in quantitative terms, student learning outcomes, pupil understanding, whatever it is that is a thing that we think constitutes a thing that we'd want to measure about education that's worth measuring, it's always a latent variable, meaning you can't observe it in the raw. You can't measure it in the same way you can measure haemoglobin levels or heart rate. It requires pro proxies and indicators, and these things require human judgment. The second thing is that measurement always comes with error. The error might be well hidden when it's nestled within the numbers, but the numbers don't make measurement error free. Now, this doesn't mean that we throw out the numbers any more than we throw out the words. It means that we need to understand the role of judgment in the amassing of the numbers and in the using of the words or the observations or whatever those other tools might be that we're using. Understanding the role of judgment in those and rather than trying to bracket that out, trying to understand how things are different in different contexts. 
So, and I suspect you're better placed in Wales to do this um, than in most, but if not all the rest of the world, what would it take for us to repossess teacher professional judgment? Well, I think it needs to be about working together to first of all place judgment front and centre, to have conversations about the place of teacher professional judgment within the broader project of teacher professionalism. And I think the responsibility for that lies with all of us, whether we're school leaders, teacher educators, teachers, policy makers, educational researchers, journalists that write about education, or anyone else interested in education. Because language matters and discourse matters, and the only way that we change it is to change the way that we talk about things. But it can't end there. To really become a critical resource for the profession, teacher professional judgment needs to be deliberately built, honed, and consolidated. And fortunately, collaborative inquiry provides an ideal vehicle for that to happen and for teachers to learn to trust in their own and their colleagues' professional judgment. And so finally, I want to point to some structures that might support teacher inquiry and teachers' engagement in and with research. And to do this, as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to very briefly sketch a couple of quite different ways that we've managed to do this in Australia. I'm not going to go into great detail on either. They've both been quite well documented in publications. And if you're so interested, then I'd encourage you to read some more about them. The first one is the network. I can't get my slides out of sync. The Coalition of Knowledge Building Schools, which was a network of schools and friends, mostly the education arms of cultural institutions, like the Australian Museum, uh, Taronga Zoo, which is our major zoo <coughs> in New South Wales, and the New South Wales State Library. It was supported by my own university and it ran for roughly 15 years, from about 2000 to 2015. The coalition was a cross-sectoral group, and this is a really unusual thing in Australia where, although school networks exist, they tend to exist along either public or non-government lines when it comes to schools working together. It was a grassroots, ground-up network that was supported by the university, um, which provided a physical space to meet in and access to academic expertise, but it was fundamentally driven by the schools. It utilised different models of academic partnership over time, but again, always driven and invited by the schools. This was very much about the teachers conducting research, about the schools engaging in thinking about what it was that they wanted to investigate and then inviting academic partners in to support them in ways to make those things happen. While many of the schools in the coalition began their commitment to teachers' engagement with research through a project in which they were involved, and sometimes those projects were externally funded, over time for all of the schools, a move became, came to the point where engagement with and in research became part of the way that we do things around here. In other words, they started to adopt inquiry as stance in the way that they engaged in educational practice. The aims of the coalition, and you can see them on the screen behind me, were about capacity building for the teachers and schools involved in terms of research literacy, research skills, and the collaborative sharing of their work. Over the years, teachers in the coalition schools worked together to shine a spotlight on a range of practices within their schools, from investigating students' experiences of different educational innovations that had been implemented within their schools, to taking a particular focus, such as on assessment or pedagogy, and investigating practices systematically, systematically over the course of a set period, sharing their findings with each other as they went. At the other end of the spectrum, the innovative links between schools and universities project involved over 100 schools in a consortium of 14 universities nationally, along with employing authorities for public school teachers and teachers unions. Within the project, schools and universities were organised into geographically based hubs known as roundtables, which met regularly over the course of the three-year project and provided a forum for networking and for the sharing of work. The project was focused on inquiry-based professional learning for both teachers and university-based researchers. So the idea was that this was a source of professional learning for everyone together, learning from and with each other. It utilised principles of teacher research which give precedence to the research questions within the school setting rather than within the academic environment. So beginning with those questions that were naturally generated around practice within schools. Research grounded in principles of collaboration and democratic research processes, both in the development of research processes and in the interpretation of research data. And finally, action-oriented research, so practical research <coughs> intended to improve educational practice. Essentially, schools focused on engaging with and conducting research related to one of seven broad areas identified by the federal government as sites of reform at the time. 
These were literacy, the middle years of schooling, post-compulsory education, curriculum statements and profiles, national equity program for schools, Aboriginal education and the education of girls. So you can see there that they were very broad areas and within those schools identified one that they thought was worth focusing on and then thought about how it was relevant to them and what they wanted to do within that. The large-scale evaluation of innovative links conducted by Anna Yatman and Judith Sachs over the course of the project and at its conclusion, along with published research out of the project itself, suggests that it was highly successful in both capacity building within schools and in the words of Grundy, Robeson and Tomasos, interrupting the way things are in schools to the advantage of both teachers and students. So while these two examples are on the one hand very different, they also share some commonalities in terms of supporting teachers' engagement in and with research. They both, for example, highlight that this work takes a sustained commitment from all involved in terms of both time and funding. While the coalition was essentially an unfunded network, individual schools provided funds to support teachers in their research work, from release time to paying for the time of academic partners who provided professional development and support, to funding for sharing teachers' work at conferences and seminars. Innovative Links, on the other hand, was funded to the tune of approximately one million Australian dollars per year, which sounds like an absolutely tiny amount these days, but it was almost 20 years ago. No, it was almost 25 years ago, in fact, which provided, and that had provided approximately 7,000 Australian dollars per school per year, um, which the equivalent today would be about 4,000 pounds. So essentially not a huge amount of money for each school, but enough to actually allow teachers to be freed up to engage in this work. Um, and, and to travel and to share their findings with each other. The second is about the development of robust partnerships between teachers and academic associates or partners. Historically in Australia, and I'm not sure, this may be very different here in Wales, these relationships have been fraught. And while the evaluations of initiatives such as these highlight that things didn't always run entirely smoothly, the broader commitment to working and learning together was a highlight of both of these structures. The third and fourth are placing at the centre of the notion that teachers' engagement in and with research is a powerful form of both professional learning and development and professional formation and renewal over the course of a career. In both cases, the process was far more important than the end result, although the end result also made a powerful contribution in many cases. In both cases, local knowledge and concerns were privileged, becoming the focus of research and professional development processes. This was not a case of university academics going to schools and saying, I'd like to do some research and will you become participants in my research? This was about it working in the opposite direction and then a reflexive relationship developing between the two. In the case of the coalition, schools discerned what next on the basis of their own interests and needs. And while schools chose to work together where they found common ground, this was by no means a requirement, so it was very much an organic thing. In the case of Innovative Links, the seven areas were sufficiently broad that schools and teachers found a space to engage in ways that made sense for them. And finally, both of these structures provided focused support for what Stenhouse referred to as systematic inquiry made public, which was his definition of research. They did this through their mechanisms for supporting teachers in developing their research capacity in the form of access to academic expertise and the expertise of each other, and in sharing their successes, failures and findings within and sometimes beyond the supportive professional community of the network. And so as we come to the end, I want to give Stenhouse the final word. There's a memorial plaque dedicated to him at the University of East Anglia. The wording on which was dedicated was decided by a group of teachers with whom he had worked over a long period of time. They chose something he was known to say and a perspective that had infused the work they had done together. It is teachers in the end who will change the world of the school by understanding it. Ultimately, if we're to change the world of the school and of our school systems for the better, I don't believe it can happen any other way, in fact. An engagement in and with research with all that it entails and all that flows from it is a powerful tool for developing such a critical understanding. Thank you. Uh, plenty of food again for thought there, and um, I'm sure colleagues, you have at least one or two questions that you'd like to ask whilst we have yeah. our international guest in the room. So it's over to you.
Uh, very thought provoking talk, thanks very much. Um, what are your opinions about the um, usefulness of meta analysis research? Well, <coughs> it's a good one to start with. I don't think that meta analysis research is inherently not useful, but I think when we engage in a meta analysis research, we need to be clear about what it is that we've actually measured and about the limitations of that research. And it, you know, it's very fashionable in Australia at the moment to make decisions at a classroom level based on meta-analysis research. And I think questions are only just starting to be asked there about, well, you know, it's not a holy grail by any means. I think it's a useful guide. It's a useful way to think about what kinds of interventions are likely to work in more cases than others. But I worry when I see it being put to such ends where without thinking about that stuff between the, the broader context and the local context, we, we think about the need to differentiate. Thanks. Anyone else? Very interesting talk, thank you very much. Um, how do you feel about pupils themselves being a centralist and doing their own research? Look, I think, you know, in the years of the, of the coalition, we did a lot of work with schools engaging not only with student voice in a kind of what do the students, how have the students experienced these things, um, but actually students engaging as researchers as well. And look, I think it's something, you know, we, we often, the student voice movement has in some ways, um, I'm not going to say become a little out of control, but, but the idea that, you know, we consult with students and we consult with students. Michael Fielding has a lovely way of thinking about the kind of hierarchy of participation of young people in research with you know participation in research at the, the bottom level of the hierarchy and then moving up through their engagement in actually helping teachers to shape research questions, shaping research questions with teachers as partners and engaging in sort of more sophisticated ways in research. Um, and so I certainly, you know, I've seen the power of that happen, but I know that it's something that takes, you know, a lot of time and effort to make happen, but I think it's actually worth, certainly worth, has been worth in those school communities that have managed to do it well. Um, that time and effort that it's taken. Sorry, just one more. <laughs> um, you, your, your, your talk has been very thought provoking for me because I come from a psychology background mm -hmm. in terms of my research, so very sort of um, quantitative in, in yep. general. And I always talk to my, my PhD students around um, the question you're trying to ask mm -hmm. should drive your research methodology. So, um, traditionally, I came from a very sort of uh, almost a, a small N kind of focus. So, yep. individual children have an experiential history that is unique. Uh, so, you can't really uh, apply generalised methods from that. But then you have a pressure within academia to move along that sort of journey mm -hmm. to evidence based towards the RCTs, the meta analysis, yep. and all of those kinds of things. But recognising that every time you do an average, score, mm -hmm. which is the basis of most experimental designs, you've lost the individuals, yep. um, and so you average out. So, um, I like it when you talk really about um, uh, professional judgment in the sense of mm -hmm. that all evidence is, the way I think about it is all evidence is useful, yes. but you have to contextualise that. Um, the struggle then I have is how do you develop um, an evidence base that can be spread mm -hmm. When, you, when your focus is always on contextualisation. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make you? sense. Look, uh, my immediate answer to that is I think we need to think about it in terms of complementary methods. Mm -hmm. You know, to go back to the work that, that Jenny Gore presented to many of you last year, you know, they, uh, they've done a, a, well, they've done several randomised control trials now looking at the effectiveness of the quality teaching framework. Um, but what's gone along with those have been very rich contextualised case studies that have actually gone, you know, they've drawn the line between how we see things working and what we, you know, what the averages tell us about how things work in these different places, to gathering other evidence that's about, well, why is it? You know, why is it that it works differently here to there? What are the conditions that open up and close off possibilities of those practices? And I think sometimes we get a little too, and I, you know, I include myself in this, I think sometimes we get a little too kind of stuck in our ways in terms of the research methods that we use and unwilling to think about the complementary ways that we might use different sources of evidence. Um, and, you know, I think that we need to get a lot better at doing that. I think that, you know, there's a, a dearth of good mixed methods research in education and I think that we need to get better at working together and, and doing that kind 
of research. So I think the danger that we all have, in a sense, is that we get um, tied to a sort of philosophy, mm. and rather than, rather than thinking about what's the question we're trying to yeah. answer here. Yeah. And that's a drive. So if we want to know someone's opinions about something, then qualitative work is probably more appropriate. Mm. Uh, but if we want to know other stuff, then we need to use mm. other methodologies. And it's not that that's good, that's bad. It's actually part yeah. of the big picture, isn't it? And about matching the questions to the kind of evidence that you collect and recognising that, that decisions about the, the methods that we use come after all of the other questions about, you know, what are, what are my beliefs about knowledge about the way that, that education works within the... After we've answered all of those questions and got to our research questions, then we think about what the methods are. And it might actually be that using a range of different methods is going to be a better way than just going to the one that we, you know, that we tend to gravitate towards. Yeah. Hi. Um, thanks, thanks, Vanika. I'm just trying to articulate my question. It's not very clear. But... Um, one could have, and this is actually building on Carl, Carl, some of Carl's questions. Really, one could have interpreted your your uh, talk as a as a railing against um, uh, quantitative methods, railing against randomised controlled trials, railing against um, Ben Goldacre. And I know that's not true, but I want, what I want you to do is to actually explain to me. Here I am, a, a class a teacher in a particular classroom, and I have this evidence of of purportedly what works that comes from. Um, a very well conducted randomised control trial. Can you spell out what you think I do with that mm -hmm. that preserves both the integrity of that evidence, but it's a, but it's a generalised evidence, yep. and my integrity as a practitioner with these kids in this classroom? Can you? Because for me, it's actually trying to understand that process of how those how it can be of use to me. Um, yep. And you're not saying throw it all out. No. Nope. It is there, and it is powerful in certain sorts of ways. Mm -hmm. But I want to use my ticket how you expect the good practitioner to use it. Okay, so I think I think it goes back to Cronbach's words about any generalisation is a hypothesis when context is taken into account. And so what I would say is that, sure, we might have this research evidence that's generated elsewhere that says that, you know, path A is better than path B. <coughs> okay, well then bring that into my classroom and let's, let's have a look at path A. But then at that point, I design a way of collecting evidence from the students within my class, a range of different types of evidence that might demonstrate their understanding of the concept that, that I'm trying to teach to them that I'm trying to teach them, um, that might reflect their, their experience, the way that they feel about themselves and about their learning in the context of that particular learning opportunity. Put those things together and work out from that whether in fact that particular intervention that's meant to be the one according to that externally generated evidence is actually one that works well for these children at this particular time in this particular place. So I think we need to think more about how we use that evidence that's generated outside and bring it into the classroom. But as Stenhouse said, the only option for you is to conduct your own research in your own classroom. Because as a researcher, he presents to us, you know, here's what my research says, but you go out and find out how that works in your own context. But how do you weight that? How, how are you going to weight that? Here is this powerful, powerful RCP knowledge mm -hmm. against my 20 years classroom experience. Well, I mean, how do you like? But, but that's, that's the challenge of of uh, best practice. But I'd actually, advice. I'd actually back your twenty years classroom experience. Mm -hmm. If not over, then on the same level yeah. as the RCT that I've designed and run. Really, I mean, let's come into conversation about that. Because I don't think it's that the the evidence that's out there actually trumps the evidence of experience. So you know, I don't. I don't rank one more highly than the other. I think we need to be in, you know, we need to put those things into tension and actually, you know, work to figure things out. Because everything works somewhere and nothing works everywhere. Nicole, you, you mentioned about, you know, semantics. And one of the things that always concerns me is how the, wor the word research is banded around. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't think it's at all helpful, mm. you know, like I'm going, to, I'm going to take half an hour out of this and I'm going to do some research. Really? Mm. No, you're not. You're going to look at your neighbour, you're going to think about that didn't work and uh, I'd better do something different. So, what words should it be using? I, I don't want, I don't want, I, okay, I care very much about teachers and teacher professionalism. and that's, mm. that's the thing I've cared about sort of throughout my professional life. Yep. But I don't want every teacher to be engaging in, in systematic inquiry made public for it to be called research. Mm. 
I really don't. Mm. I want them to be intellectuals. I want them to think. I want them to engage in research. Yeah. So can you help me, please? Help me out of this. Look, what what words can we use? Well, I think that there's absolute power in the Cochrane, Smith and Lytle notion of inquiry as stats. The idea that we, that we use an inquiring lens on our practice. And it doesn't mean that I need to take half an hour out and do some research now. It's about the idea that we educate teachers right from the very beginning in their initial teacher education to be asking critical questions of their own practice so that it actually becomes part of the way that they engage in that practice. And then it might be that they move from there into kind of systematic inquiry made public as they move into schools. But, you know, if they've, if they've actually got that kind of orientation to inquiry as part of just what they do every day, you know, and I think, you know, we naturally as a, as a profession tend to be inquirers because most teachers, or most good teachers anyway, are constantly thinking about, you know, that thing that I'm going to do next week with the kids and I did it last year and it fell a bit flat because, you know, so how am I going to change that? What will I move about it? You know, helping them to understand that as a, as a really important resource for their own professional development and formation over the course of their careers I think is an important one. You know, Susan Groundwater Smith and I have talked about it as profession as inquiry-based professional learning. And I tend to like that kind of term, the inquiry-infused thing, a little more than research. And it worries me as well that we're, you know, the way that we use that kind of language. Um, I mean, in the project that Megan and I have done the, the first little bit of at the moment, one of the things that we did out of the interviews was gather a whole lot of terms that we heard a lot, things like effect size and value-added measures, and ask the teachers in the surveys, you know, how well do you think that you know about these things? And we found that, you know, something like 80% of them reckoned that they could um, explain, confidently explain sampling error to a colleague. Now, I actually don't believe that, but I think that there's something going on there that means that teachers, many teachers feel like they need to subscribe to these things and so that's what I meant when I talked about thoroughly conscious ignorance you know recognizing that it's actually okay not to know that stuff there are people that can explain to you what sampling error is and why you need to be a little bit wary when you look at this thing that looks so exact over here um, <coughs> thoroughly conscious ignorance might help us to actually recognize that I don't need to have that expertise I don't need to be a researcher that's not my job I am a teacher there are other people who are researchers we come together and share our expertise as different but equal Thanks. Does it also link to the definition of evidence mm -hmm. um, and the comparison between sort of research evidence and your 20 years experience mm -hmm. evidence of what you do in, in yep. the classroom? Well? I think that's true. Stenhouse has had some very interesting things to say about evidence and the difference between information and evidence. And he talked about how, in fact, you know, all information can become <coughs> evidence when we put it to some useful purpose. But again, we need to be a bit systematic about that and about thinking about what that piece of information is actually good evidence of. And it goes back to questions around how do we think about different types of evidence for different purposes and put them together in ways that make sense. Is it okay if I say something else? Sure. Okay, fine. <laughs> okay. I mean, one of the things I think is important is this whole business of, 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 collab of, of collaborating mm -hmm. with colleagues within school, not least because um, teachers have to routinize a lot of what they do, mm -hmm. and a lot of their a lot of their professional knowledge is in fact tacit. Mm -hmm. It's through, if you like, working together, through talking together, planning together, observing each other as peers, not as in a kind of a mm -hmm. hierarchical appraisal thing. That, if you like, that tacit knowledge, which is so much of professional knowledge, can be articulated, acknowledged and actually examined, looked at and think, wow, I do that and I haven't thought about mm -hmm. actually why I do that um, so much and so on. So I, th so I think the whole collaborative thing within mm -hmm. schools, across schools, is, is critically important. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm. Yeah. I think that's true and I think, I think it's a particular type of collaboration that draws teachers into critical conversations yeah. about practice. Yeah. We have far too much congeniality and not enough real collegiality. Sure. And so, you know, sometimes having a framework or something that actually we're using as a shared language mm -hmm. helps with that. And, you know, that's the power of the quality teaching framework, mm -hmm. but it actually draws teachers into conversations with each other about what they do. They develop a shared mm -hmm. language and are able to actually use it to critique each other's practice. 
and to give each other feedback and to affirm each other's practice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, but I think it all goes back to understanding the difference between congeniality. Congeniality means everyone's birthday gets celebrated and it's all very lovely and we have a Christmas party and that's great. Authentic collegiality is something quite different to that. And we, you know, that doesn't happen by happenstats. We need mm -hmm. to think about ways that we generate that in across schools, within schools, and within different bits of schools in many cases. Mm -hmm. One more. Hi, I, I don't know if this is a question, but it's an observation based on some work that we've been doing. A number of colleagues in the room will be doing similar projects, the, the National Professional Inquiry Project, which resonates with one of the structures that you talked mm -hmm. about, where uh, the, the pioneer schools are, are working with HEIs collectively to, to generate inquiry um, projects within the, within the school base, which will inform the professional learning for the new curriculum and then becoming lead inquirers. Right. And there's, there's a whole policy about it, and there's funding behind that, behind that project. And my, what I've, I've heard some really important conversations today, and a lot of them are around process. Mm -hmm. The process of asking questions and, and inquiry as starts is a process. Mm -hmm. But it, uh, attention, I think, currently in the system of is I think Kevin's gone, so I hope someone's going to feed this back to Kevin or, or colleagues in the room will talk to him about it. But there's a, we, we're in a system where there's an expectation that we celebrate the product. Mm -hmm. So that there's a move to what, what's the report? That we need the report by this deadline and then we need the findings and we're going to share the findings. And I keep, my feeling is what we're hearing is actually we need to talk about the process. Yeah and celebrate these processes of inquiry so we understand them better rather than rushing to a product which makes us performative. Mm. So I, I do think we need, to, we need to engage in that conversation of process mm. and acknowledge this is a complex, challenging, um, very exciting area, but it's, we can't rush to the product. Yep. And I think that for me is something I've really listened to and, and really tried to understand carefully about what you've said. So I don't yeah. think it's a question, I think it's a kind of observation. Yeah, but thank, I, mean, look, I think that that's so important, Jane. And I think um, it, Susan and I wrote a paper some years ago called Practitioner Inquiry Beyond Celebration, which was exactly mm -hmm. about that, and spurred on by a question that John Furlong asked at the end of one of our presentations at AARE, mm -hmm. where he said, oh, gee, well, that's all really interesting, but it all sounds very celebratory. And Susan and I went, it's not celebratory. That's not what we were meant to be doing. Anyway, it sent us off on this whole trajectory that took about five years of thinking about how do we pay due attention to the process and try to move beyond the celebration. Recognising that the, the work needs to be affirmed and that teachers need to, in particularly teachers, need to feel good about what they've achieved, but how do we shift the emphasis from the product to the process? But it's a really, really difficult thing to do because when we get funding from elsewhere, it's all about the end point. We're all going to get together and have a conference and share our work. and you know. um, So it's a, I think it's a tough one, but I think it is a really important thing for us to do. <coughs> Thank you ever so much.